Hi everyone, this is Dr. A again. So we are going to cover genetics and I'm going to go back in detail over the whole um, subject of genetics that you, you know, possibly learn in biology and um, should have learned some in anatomy one. But these principles are really important because genetics is really at the forefront of the development now of new testing in microbiology and um, the work on the microbiome and all of that is a lot of it's just j based in genetics and stuff. And so it, a good understanding of genetics is really, really super important in this day and age um, with the current testing and stuff that we've got going on. Okay, so let's review uh, genetics. So the genome is the sum total of the genetic material of an organism. So most of the genome will exist in the form of chromosomes. Some of it can appear as plasmid or in certain organelles of the eukaryotes. So uh, a plasmid is a code that's separate. And then, uh, for example, mitochondria have mitochondrial DNA. The genome of the cells is composed entirely of DNA. So whether it's a bacterial cell or a you know, human cell, if it's a cell, it has DNA. But the genome of viruses can contain either DNA or RNA, um, never both, right? So it's either a DNA virus or an RNA virus. Okay, so a chromosome is a, a discrete cellular structure that is composed of a neatly packaged DNA molecule. So the DNA molecule is uh, packed into this specific shape, and that is called a chromosome. Now, it's not always visible in chromosome form, um, oftentimes, it's just loosely coiled, uh, but when it does pack it up neatly at the point of cell division, uh, the forms that you see are called chromosomes. Uh, eukaryotic chromosomes, the DNA, when it's packaged, is wound around histones. Uh, it is always located in the nucleus. It can be diploid in pairs or haploid uh, in singles. And Usually you see the haploid forms uh, with cellular reproduction with eggs and sperm and stuff like that. It has a linear appearance, so uh, they're in lines, they're in segments that are linear okay, in your eukaryotes. Uh, and they're usually multiple ones. Uh, so for example, your human cell has 46 chromosomes. And then your bacterial chromosomes, uh, the DNA is condensed into a packet by means of histone-like proteins. So they're not quite histones, but it's sure to look a lot like them. And a uh, bacterial chromosome is always a single circular chromosome. And so uh, I do want to point out here, so this is uh, a karyotype, uh, a human one, because there are 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? Uh, and where they're diploid, there's two of these right there. Just well, diploid. And if it was in a haploid form, there would only be one, right? So one of those. So, um, for example, if you if you think about it uh, in terms of humans, this is chromosome one. Well, one of these you got from your mama, the other one you got from your daddy, okay? And so at one point in time, this chromosome was in your mom's egg, and this chromosome was in your daddy's sperm. So they were, at that point, they were in haploid form. They were half of, of the chromosome one, and, and then here's the other half, the match one there. And um, so on that, too, um, it's going to become relevant here in just a second, uh, also when we talk about genotype versus phenotype. So there are three categories of genes in, um, in, all, in these chromosomes, right? You have structural genes. They code for proteins. So they're the actual recipe to make a protein, an enzyme or something, to build your cell, to make it function and all that. There are also the genes that code for the RNA machinery that's used in protein production. So that's your ribosomal RNA. And then there are regulatory genes. And actually, the bulk of your code are regulatory genes. And they control gene expression. So they control when things are made uh, and so by turning it on or off and if they're made or not made and stuff like that, right? So two other concepts that are really important are genotype and phenotype. So when you look at this karyotype here, that would be, if you, you know, reading each of these chromosomes gives you the genotype, the sum total of all the genes for this individual right here, okay? 
So, and this is again, looking at a human, but you can do something very, you can do similar, except of course, in the bacteria would be one certain, one chromosome, but anyway, so, um, the, the genotype is all of the genetic material. So it's, it's all the chromosomes you got from mom, all the ones you get from dad, you know, half and half, all of it put together. The phenotype is the expression of those traits, of certain traits, um, via structures or functions. So it's uh, when a gene is read and expressed into a protein or expressed into turning something on or off, that is the phenotype, that's the expression of the gene. So uh, to illustrate this, for example, um, let's say that, uh, we're going to use humans again, you have um, two, there's two genes that you have. You have a gene for blue eyes and a gene for brown eyes. You got the gene for blue eyes from your mom, but the gene for brown eyes from your dad, and you have brown eyes, okay? Well, in your genotype, you have blue eye and brown eye. You have the code for both. So if your genotype was red, you would see the code for blue eye, and you would see the code for brown eye, on, uh, so you would have it, let's say it's on, I don't even know what, which chromosome eye color is on, but let's just say it's on chromosome one. Then, uh, you'd have on one, this one, you'd have the code somewhere there to code for blue eye. And on this one, you have somewhere there to code for brown eyes. Okay. And then, uh, the expression can be, uh, of these genes can be determined whether the gene is dominant or recessive and stuff like that. But, uh, in our example, brown eyes is always dominant. So it always overrides the blue eye so that what you would express would be brown eyes and you have brown eyes. Okay. But you carry the gene for blue eyes. So you could potentially, um, if you got with your mate and your mate had the gene for blue eyes also they carried it, even if they had brown eyes but had the gene for blue eye and you had the gene for blue eye you could feasibly you know participate an egg and then participate a sperm to make a baby that has blue eyes okay even though you don't express that trait you carry the that trait as a genotype okay so just remember the genotype is the sum total of all the, the codes the genetic codes that you have all the genes that you have, but the phenotype is what you actually make with it. Um, so you could carry the code for something and, and not make it. Totally possible. So again, this illustrates all the different forms of genetic material. So you have your eukaryotic cell. So for that would be your human cells, but then also your yeast and your protozoans and all of that. Their um, uh, chromosomes, genes are, the, the chromosomes are found in the nucleus, their genes are found in the chromosomes, but the genetic material can also be found in mitochondria, like the mitochondrial DNA, also in chloroplast, and in plasmids, which are like free-floating little um, bits of DNA code. Your viruses will either be a DNA virus or an RNA virus, never both. And then your bacteria here will have a circular chromosome, single circular chromosome, right? And then potentially we'll have plasmids also. Okay, so this is a match the, the word uh, to its um, definition of function up there. So I'll let you work through that in um, the Neopod lesson. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the DNA code. So the nucleotide is the basic unit of DNA structure. It is made of a phosphate, a deoxyribose, sugar, and a nitrogenous base. That's where you get DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, right? So it's a deoxyribose and a nitrogenous base as DNA. Okay. So uh, nucleotides. So these building blocks will co covalently bond to each other in a sugar phosphate linkage that will become the backbone of each strand. So they, uh, each nucleotide assembles to the next kind of like little Lego building blocks and they can just, uh, they, they, they make, and to make a backbone and we're going to look at it here in a second. I'm going to show you. So each sugar attaches in a repetitive pattern to two phosphates. One of the phosphates will attach to the number five prime carbon of that sugar, and the other one is attached to the three prime carbon of that sugar. And so let me show you what the heck they mean, because you will see a lot of the five prime, three prime um, idea when you're talking about DNA and stuff. So 
uh, in pink is the sugar right here. Okay. It is a five carbon sugar. So it has the oxygen here. And in these representations, every time it bends, basically you have a carbon. So we have sugar, we have carbon one, which is the carbon on which your uh, nitrogenous base is attached to. The nitrogenous bases are your ACTs and Gs of your genetic code. Okay, so carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, so this is three prime, and you have a phosphate that's attached to it, okay? And then you have carbon four and carbon five, and then it's attached to the other phosphate, okay? And so then this phosphate that's attached to the three prime of this sugar, three prime carbon of this sugar is attached to the five prime of this sugar, okay? And so they assemble in this manner, and the direction of assembly and the direction in which you read the code is always going to be five prime to three prime. So you read it this way. Okay. And note that this strand is running five prime to three prime. So it's like flipped from the other one. They, they run like in opposite directions like this instead of like this, they run like this. Okay. So, um, but you can see the layout here of what three prime and five prime means, and it gives a directionality to the code. Uh, so an order in which you can read the letters um, that are the bases and stuff. Okay, so nitrogenous bases will attach long a uh, strand by covalent bonds at the one prime position of the sugar. So that, that first carbon I showed you. Purines and pyrimidines will join with their complementary bases using weak hydrogen bonds. So there's all hydrogen bonds that can be easily be undone so that um, the, the two DNA strands can be actually separated and then put back and separated and put back. Um, the molecule can be easily unzipped that way you can, so you can gain access to the information uh, encoded by the bases and copy it and uh, make protein from it and all of that. The pairing of the bases is dictated by the formation of hydrogen bonds between the bases. Adenine always pairs with thymine, so A with T, and guanine always pairs with cytosine, so uh, G and C. Always, always, always. You cannot pair A with G or A with C. <clears throat> you cannot pair G with T. It just, it just doesn't work. It just won't, it won't bind. So if you Look at it now with the bases illustrated. So again, you have this one is running in the, the downward direction. So five prime, here's the five prime to the three prime, you know, and so and so on. And then the five prime of this one to the three prime, et cetera. So it's running in this direction. And that one is running in that direction. And then if you look here is guanine and cytosine, they make three little hydrogen bonds between each other right there. So they're a good match. Right? And then um, adenine and thymine, they make two. Okay. So it's like C is a three bond, but like A is a two. And that's why they can't, they can't bond. They, they can't match up. Okay. So that doesn't work. So it's always C and G bound, bind together and A and T bind together. Um, and it's universal uh, through all, all the different organisms, stuff like that. It's always like that. Okay, so again, match up uh, how they pair up, right? So match them up the way they pair up. Okay, so the nature of the double helix. So these, um, they have anti-parallel arrangements. So this would be parallel. So see my fingers are pointing in the same direction. That's not how they're arranged. They're arranged anti-parallel where, uh, as you can see, or I can just do it this way, if you will, fingers are running in opposite directions, okay, pointing, okay, that way. So, um, but, you know, different direction to the strands. Um, and the order of the bond between the carbon on the deoxyribose and the phosphate is used to keep track of the direction of the two sides. And so that gives you the direction in which to read the strand. One side runs from five prime to three prime and the other from, from three prime to five prime, but you always read five to three. And so this is a very significant factor in your synthesis of DNA and in protein production. So um, DNA replication. So DNA replication is basically copying the DNA, the entire genetic code. It's, that's what DNA replication is. DNA replication happens when a cell is trying to copy itself so whether it's a bacteria cell doing binary fission and making two bacterial cells, or 
a eukaryotic cell, a yeast making a new yeast, or uh, one of your cells replenishing skin cells or whatever, making copies of itself, right? And um, if you will use this um, analogy here, your your genetic code or the bacterial genetic code, whatever, is akin to a, um, a cookbook, okay? So it's a collection of recipes of things and, and instructions on how to do things and you know, what to do and all of that. And so when you do DNA replication, it's like you copy the entire cookbook and now you have two cookbooks and one goes into each cell, okay? So the overall replication process, this DNA copying, is what we call a semi-conservative replication. So it requires a careful orchestration of the actions of 30 different enzymes. The enzyme separates the strands of the existing DNA, so they separate them. They copy one strand at a time, and from each strand, they'll, they'll produce two daughter molecules. And so basically, the strands are together, they pull them apart, and then each, each strand becomes a template for the new strand. Each daughter molecule is identical to the parent in composition, and neither is completely new. You have one strand that serves as a template, as is the original parent uh, of the DNA strand. So um, I have a graphic that's color that's going to show you this. So here's your double helix DNA. It is unwound, so you have one half of it here, one half of it there. So one strand here, one strand there. This strand is uh, copied in a continuous manner, so it just keeps adding and if it's an A, it will add a, a T. If it's a C, it will add a G, et cetera. So it's copying it. So basically, this code right here is going to be absolutely identical to this part of the blue strand right here. Okay. And on the other one, it has to, because it has to read in a direction, so it actually has to copy it in that direction. So it's going to copy it like this, and then it's going to start back here, and it's going to copy it until it links up with that one, and it's going to keep going that way. So if you look at it here, in blue, you have your parent strands, right? And in red, you have your daughter strands. So from from the 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 one, you get two, and in each of the the this becomes one new recipe book, and this becomes another new recipe book. Um, half of it is from the original, and half of it is new. Half of it is from the original. Half of it is new. Okay, so this is a, a, a cool video animation that I'm just going to comment over. Um, and so, uh, first, up, we have the molecular visualization of DNA. And so, it's going to show you DNA and how it packages itself into chromosomes and winds itself around histones. So, DNA is actually a, quite a lengthy molecule. And, uh, like, you know, one molecule of DNA can be like six foot long if you just had it all the way end to end. And so it's, you know, it's, it, you have its double helix structure, but then it's coiled again around the histone. So these purple proteins that they show there are the histone proteins. And so it winds it around these histone proteins, and then it winds the histone proteins again in a strand, right? It's kind of like making string. It's like winding it and then winding it. And so, and then these that have been wound are going to be wound again, and tighter and tighter into where you can pack up all of this genetic material into the form that is the chromosome form, right? So you can see how it's just packaging it and packaging it and winding it tighter and tighter and tighter uh, so that it's all nice and neat and compact. And so now you've got our typical chromosome uh, that you can see that forms and then separates, right? And uh, you'll end up with two um, new daughter cells that way. So all of the chromosomes are copied, duplicated, and then they're split, and then you end up with 46 and 46. So at one point in time, you have 92 in there, and then it pulled apart right here, there during cellular division, and now you have two entire new cells. Okay, so then it's going to go to DNA replication. So again, DNA replication is the copying of the DNA. And so what it's showing is, um, here's the original strand. This is helicase. Helicase is unwinding it and, and, and pulling the strands apart, right? And um, one of these, so this one's actually continuously copying it. Right here you can see there's DNA polymerase 
is, is feeding it continuously, right? The other one is copying it, has to read it backwards, or it has to read it again. It's in the proper direction, but it's opposite from, from this one. And so it draws it out in loops, copies it in this direction right here. It's going there, 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 and it'll link up, and then it's going to do another strand. And so that one's a little bit more complex. This one, it just keeps feeding it through. And as it does that, again, you will have from the parent molecule feeding in right here, you will have half the parent molecule is going into that new one. The other half is going into the other new one. And so um, it just keeps doing that until it's run all the way through the um, entire uh, genome, well, the, you know, the entirety of that um, gene. Okay, so um, some of the enzymes that are involved in DNA replication are helicase, it unzips the DNA helix, Primase synthesizes an RNA primer, which starts, it's, it's the beginning uh, portion where you can start adding the bases to it, right? DNA polymerase 3 will add the bases to the new DNA chain, and it can also proofread the chain for mistakes. DNA polymerase 1 removes the primer, that RNA primer. It closes any kind of gaps and repairs uh, mismatches in the strand. Ligase does a final binding of different NICs if there's cuts or nicks in the DNA, things that haven't joined up right. Um, and so it joins it back up during synthesis and repair. And then topoisomerase 1 and 2 are involved in supercoiling and untangling. So supercoiling is what we saw at the beginning of the video where it's winding tight and tight and tight, right? So coiling it uh, and then untangling would be the opposite of that. And so again, illustrated here, our, our parent strand, uh, the double helix, is separated into its two strands that are complementary to each other. One of them can be continuously copied as it unwinds. You just can just keep adding the bases as it unwinds, keep adding the bases. The other one has to be copied in the opposite direction. So this one was copied. Now it's copying this section. Then it'll copy another section and so on. Um, and these fragments are actually called Okazaki, Okazaki fragments, and they have to be linked together. Okay, so then transcription and translation. So um, if our genetic material is our cookbook and replication is making an entire new cookbook um, identical to the you know the first one, the the transcription is copying a recipe out of the cookbook. Okay, and then translation is taking that recipe into the kitchen and making the stuff. All right, so transcription, you from the master code of DNA, it is uh, you synthesize an RNA molecule, and the RNA molecule is going to be a copy of that recipe from the cookbook from the DNA. Okay, and then translation, you take that transcribed RNA, so that RNA that co that got copied, it leaves the the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm, and then uh, it enters the kitchen, if you will the ribosomes, and uh, it, the ribosomes use it to produce a protein. There are a few exceptions to this pattern. RNA viruses can convert RNA to other RNA, and retroviruses can convert RNA to DNA. And then there's a wide variety of RNAs that are used to regulate gene function, and you'll see these here in just a second. Okay, so I'm going to show you another video. Again, I'm going to comment, and so this is uh, going to be the other portions. So we, um, on this one, we have your DNA molecule. And so this is the beginning of a gene. And so the machinery is assembling at the beginning of this gene is fixing to start reading that certain section of the chromosome. And there it goes. It just launched that one molecule and it's reading, it's going down the, the gene here and it's reading it and making the yellow molecule is RNA. It's, you see it's single-stranded, and it's pulling the nucleotide bases in, and it's adding it in uh, in the right sequence. So you can see it, it unzips it, right, and reads it, but then it recoils it. So, um, so this is a two-stranded, you know, DNA molecule, and... Um, you know, the, the polymerase is just reading it and there's just feeding those nucleotides. So these are your A, C, T's, and G's being fed in there and added in the right sequence to be a correct copy here of that recipe and that gene. 
And so it's going to keep going like that until it reaches the end. And then it's going to send that RNA molecule. The RNA molecule is small, it's thin enough, it can leave the nucleus, whereas the DNA never leaves the nucleus. Okay, so um, again, here, this one is a bacterial DNA molecule. So with the bacterial DNA molecule, you can uh, transcribe that DNA. And uh, so that's copying it into RNA. So you can make out of it transfer RNA, which we're going to see its job, messenger RNA, which is the copy. Uh, so if you will, transfer RNA would be like a tool that you need to make the recipe. Messenger RNA would be actually the recipe, and ribosomal RNA is used to make ribosomes, which are the kitchen. Okay, and it can also make out of those some of that RNA can be uh, a regulatory RNA. So the regulatory RNAs are microRNA, interfering RNA, and uh, antisense RNA, and riboswitches and stuff. And these guys can regulate transcription and translation, so it can feed back to, you know, making more or less, you know, of the copies there. And it can also, um, you know, int um, control this um, translation of RNA. So translation of RNA is taking the, the messenger RNA, the recipe into the kitchen, which is the ribosome, and using the transfer RNA to bring the different amino acids to assemble the recipe in the correct sequence. And if you have the correct sequence of amino acid, you will have the correct protein, and it will fold itself into some 3D shape uh, and to have, will have its function. So let's talk a little bit about RNA. So RNA is similar to DNA in terms of its general properties, but um, it is different in several ways. So first of all, it is a uh, single-stranded molecule. It does exist in a helical form, so in a helix, right? It can assume sec secondary and tertiary levels of complexity so that it can start folding, and uh, that leads to the specialized form, so the transfer RNA and the ribosomal RNA. So instead of just being a helix, it can take on like a 3D shape, right? Uh, it contains uracil instead of thymine. So thymine is re uh, replaced by uracil, which is really, really close. It's not the same, but it's close, and it will match up with adenine no problem. Uh, it, again, it does not change the DNA code because uracil, it follows the pairing rules. It binds with um, adenine, and so per it's perfect. Um, and ribose is the sugar instead of deoxyribose, and that's why RNA is ribonucleic acid is because ribose for the ribose sugar. And so it's also a, uh, a five-carbon sugar, very similar. Um, RNAs, so you your regulatory RNAs, as I mentioned, are your microRNA, your antisense RNAs, ribose switches, and small interfering RNAs. If you're really interested in the subject, you can go into dive deeper into what these guys do. Um, I just want you to know that they exist. Uh, your primer RNAs uh, operate both in bacterial and eukaryotic cells, so they start the copying of DNA and stuff like that. In ribozymes, they remove unneeded sequences from other RNAs, so it's, uh, think uh, ribosome enzymes, right? So uh, if there's unneeded sequences um, from other RNAs, they can just cut them, cut them up and remove them. So after transcription, so after the recipe is copied, uh, you have to have translation. So you have to make the recipe into the protein. So, uh, and that's, you use ribosomes to do that, and ribosomes are akin to the kitchen, okay? So uh, the ribosomes of prokaryotes and eukaryotes are different in size. So the ones that are found in bacteria, um, mitochondria, and uh, chloroplasts are 70S in size. They m are made up of a 50S and a 30S subunits. Whereas your eukaryotic ribosomes are ADS and they're made up of a 60S and 40S subunit. So basically you can think of eukaryotic cells having a slightly larger kitchen than your ribosome, than uh, your uh, bacteria. Okay, the small subunit, uh, so the small portion of your ribosome, it, it comes in two, two, two pieces. The small unit binds to the beginning, the five prime end of that message RNA, so the beginning of the recipe. And the large subunit then is going to land on it and bind to it, and it will uh, bring the enzymes that are needed to make the peptide bonds. That's where your transfer RNA binds into and all of that. So this is what it looks like. So this is the five prime end of your messenger RNA. So this is the beginning of the code. This is the small ribosome subunit. This is the large one. And again, it just like assembles sandwich style. 
here on that and it starts reading this and we'll see it will match so this is transfer RNA and it has a code on here it has it has a way to read the code and if it reads it correctly it can add its little amino acid so it carries transfer RNA carries an amino acid here represented in purple and um, if this one can bind and then this one can bind next to it then these two amino acids can be linked up together okay and then it the whole thing shifts it moves over and then it'll the the transfer RNA will let go of the amino acid and the chain will start growing and so we're going to show the process again so here's RNA that leaves the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are located so it leaves command central goes to the kitchen okay here's the beginning of the code small unit binds on it large unit binds on it and then it feeds it through you know, from beginning to end and then all these little green floaty things represent transfer RNA and then in red is a representation of the protein coming out and so it shows your your bases here so ACTs and G's and it's reading those ACTs and I'm sorry AC U and G's uh, and um, it's reading them through so now it's like opening up the ribosome showing you these transfer RNA reading it and bringing their amino acid and adding them to the chain if it's you know if it's a right amino acid it can let go of it and move on etc so you can see it goes really really fast it's reading every time it's reading uh, three of these as a codon so these are each transfer RNA has a different codon and will carry a different amino acid we'll talk about codons here in just a second so uh, they vary they're, they're all different so they each carry their own amino acid and uh, and again if it can if it can match up if it, the bottom of the, that transfer RNA can match up to the code then uh, the protein will start forming and coming out of the top of that ribosome here so it just keeps feeding it and feeding it, and then that protein is going to start folding and assuming it's three-dimensional shape so anyway you get the gist of that we're going to move on from that and so um, match up the each of the stages here and what it does pretty easy so the master genetic code a codon is a group of three nucleotides that dictate which amino acid is added to the growing peptide chain so peptides is basically the growing protein chain. And so um, there are 64 different triplet codes in 20 amino acids. I'll show you a table that makes sense in a second. Some amino acids are represented by several codons and this redundancy then allows for the insertion of the correct amino acid even if you have a mistake in DNA sequence. So here these three letters are represented by one, this is one codon, so this is A, U, and G nucleotides and then we have ACA is your next codon okay and so um, first a question so which one of these is a codon so again this is just where you paying attention kind of thing pick one of these which one you think is a codon and then here's the table I promised you so um, these are the different codons and amino, amino acids that they represent so for example UUU is phenylalanine and UUC is phenylalanine so if this last nucleotide gets changed from U to C it still codes for phenylalanine but if it gets changed from C to A then this codon is going to code for leucine okay and then all of these also code, uh, will code for leucine so CUU CUC, CUA, and CUG. So basically, if you have CU, doesn't matter what you have at the, at the end, you're going to have leucine. Leucine is going to be read as the amino acid. And so you can see all the different amino acids. Um, AUG is also is the start codon. Uh, UAA and UAG are the, uh, is a stop codon, and UGA is also a stop codon, meaning uh, start meaning beginning of the recipe, stop meaning end of the recipe, right? And so uh, the table is also organized um, where uh, if your first base position is U, they're all listed here. C, they're all listed in this row. A, they're all listed in that row. And G, they're all listed in this row. If your second base is U, they're all listed in this column. C, this column. A, that column. G. And then 
for the third uh, one is all listed right there. So um, starting with your DNA, so let's just follow a code on. So uh, in your DNA, so this is one strand, the other strand, so the two strands of your DNA, you have this codon says ATG, which then match, matches TAC, so A with T, G with C, right? So this is good. When this is copied as, um, this code is copied as a messenger RNA, it will become AUG instead of ATG, right? So AUG, so just read this and made AUG, and this then can bind to UAC because A bonds with U, U with A, C with G, okay? So that would be the code at the bottom of that transfer RNA. It's the anti-codon. This on the RNA messenger RNA is a codon, and then that allows it to uh, link up the amino acid that it's carrying, which is um, L-methionine here. Add it to the beginning of that chain. The next one is going to be uh, GAC, which then would match up to U C U G. C U G would match up to the anti codon G A C, which would add leucine and so on. And you just keep going, and the, the body does that and it does it at like lightning speed. It's quite incredible. Okay, so here uh, C A G is a codon for which amino acid? You can click on this table, it'll make it bigger, and then if you exit out, and so just hunt it down and then select which one it is. And then um, this is interesting too. Um, so bacteria can do this more so than we can. So we usually just um, <clears throat> trans transcribe the messenger RNA and translate it into a protein into a single ribosome. But you can, uh, bacteria can be also quite effective. And so basically, the the first ribosome assembles at the beginning of the messenger RNA and starts making a protein, and then a second ribosome can uh, assemble as it's being fed through, it can latch onto the beginning, and then as it's being fed through a third one, and so you can have, as it goes here, seven ribosomes making the same protein if you need it for it to be mass produced. Okay, so uh, genetic regulation of this protein synthesis. Control mechanisms do ensure that genes are active only when they're needed. So uh, enzymes are only produced when they're needed, and they're not produced unnecessarily because it does require, you know, energy and stuff from the cell. So um, in the regulation of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes uh, use antisense RNA, microRNAs, and riboswitches. Again, just mentioning those in passing, you can dig in a little bit more. But let's talk about operons. So operons are only found in bacteria, and they an operon is a coordinated set of genes that's regulated as a single unit. So if we we'll go back to our analogy of recipes, so um, let's say you're going to make a cream pie, okay? Well, to make a cream pie, you need to make <clears throat> a base, right, the, the pie crust. You need to make the cream portion, like the, the pudding portion, and then uh, if you do it traditionally, you need to make the meringue, right? And so you need three recipe for one thing to make the one pie. And so if you were a bacteria, those, the, those three recipes would be linked into an operon, if you will, right? Um, and so um, operons can be inducible or repressible, so they can be turned on or off, right? Uh, the catabolic operon is um, induced by the substrate of the enzyme for which the structural gene codes. So what the heck does that mean? That means that, okay, a substrate is what an enzyme works on, okay, to break it down to make something else. Or to, yeah, well, let's just say to break it down. If that substrate is present, if that molecule is here and needs to be broken down, that turns on the gene for the enzyme that is needed to break down this molecule. That's what it means. Uh, and so therefore it only produces the enzyme when that molecule, that substrate is present. And if that substrate's not there, it just doesn't make it because it doesn't need it. It doesn't need to break it down, it's not there, right? Uh, repressible operon um, are, for example, anabolic enzymes. So by the way, catabolic breaks down, anabolic builds, okay? So um, they are turned off by the product synthesized by the enzyme. So it's very simple. If, if it's a, 
a building enzyme, right? That means it takes two substrates, puts, puts stuff together, and makes a product. So it's building product, right? Well, as product is made, the presence of the product turns off the building process. And, okay, we got it. It's made. Thank you very much. And so um, it is a repressible uh, operon, repressible enzyme, because it's repressed by the presence of what it's making. So there you go. So let's talk about DNA recombination. So recombination um, is, um, if you will, a way for genetics to be shuffled a little bit. So bacteria have no exact equivalent to sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction in humans and in animals and all that is what gives variety to the human race and uh, uniqueness to each individual. An event, uh, so recombination is an event in which one bacterium donates DNA to another bacterium. The end result is a new strain that's different both from the donor and the original recipients. So they're changed forever um, by the, the gift or this acquisition of the new DNA the, or extra DNA, if you will. Um, it depends on the fact that bacteria have plasmids and are really good at interchanging genes. So the plasmid, again, is a, a gene uh, that is separate from the main chromosome. So it's uh, like to-go recipes, basically. Um, they provide usually plasmids and recombination events usually re uh, provide genes for resistance to drugs uh, and resistance to different metabolic poisons, for new functional and metabolic capabilities, and for increased virulence and ad adaptation to its environment. Uh, the recombinant is any organism that contains gene that originated in another organism. Okay, so let's first talk horizontal gene transfer. So horizontal gene transfers is any transfer of DNA that results in organisms acquiring new genes that did not come from the parent organism. So again, vertical is parent-child or mother-daughter kind of thing, if you will. So it goes from, you know, one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. Horizontal is buddy to buddy, okay? So um, for that, you need plasmids. So plasmids, again, are small circular pieces of DNA that contain their own origin of replication so that because Bacterial DNA and plasmids are circular, they're a circle. You have to have something that indicates this is the beginning. That's the original re replication. So it start here, right? and then copy it that way. Uh, they can replicate independently of the chromosome. So, um, for example, the cell does not to be, need to be specifically dividing for that uh, plasmid to copy itself. It can just copy itself all on its own and then just share the copy. And plasmids are not necessary for the survival of the cell, but they do confer useful traits and advantages that will increase its survival. And then uh, another way um, that, that another form of DNA transfer is uh, you, instead of using plasmid, is chromosomal fragments. Um, and so they're, they're bits of chromosomes. But if it's a chromosomal fragment, a chromosomal fragment cannot become a plasmid. A chromosomal fragment has to be inserted into the chromosome in order to be replicated um, and copied and stuff like that, so replicated or copied. So there are three types of horizontal gene transfer. The first one is conjugation. So uh, in conjugation, the donor cell with a uh, pillus will, um, it will basically, um, we have to have the, the fertility plasmid in the donor, you have, so you have to have the little code, the little plasmid that needs, that can be given. Both donors and recipient must be alive, okay, so they're both actively, you know, metabolizing and doing things like that, and there's a bridge that's formed between the two cells. The plasmid is copied and it's transferred across the bridge. It's all uh, Conjugation is also often referred to as bacterial sex because they link up together and they, and they exchange genetic material. And so uh, the transfer is a direct transfer, so they have to link up and directly connect for the genetic material to go back and forth. The, the types of genes that are commonly transferred in nature through conjugation are genes for drug resistance, resistance to metallic uh, toxins, production of enzymes, and adherence molecules. Then you have transformation. So transformation is when free donor DNA as a DNA fragment 
is taken up by a live competent recipient cell. So basically the donor is dead and its DNA has got into fragments and is floating around, but the recipient is alive and the recipient can say, okay, thank you very much. I will take this little code. Um, and so that is an indirect transfer because they don't have to be linked up or, um, you know, ex the exchange doesn't go from one cell to the next through a direct connection. And one of the, the types of genes is a type uh, for a polysaccharide capsule can be done by uh, transfer by transformation. And then transduction, uh, the donor cell is lysed, so it's, it's ruptured. And um, there, and it's usually because of a bacteriophage. And one of the bacteriophages uh, picked up the donor DNA. And uh, so a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacterial cells. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to go inserted into a lab recipient, um, and it, it will receive that DNA. Again, that's an indirect because it goes via the bacteriophage, uh, which is a virus. And uh, genes that are commonly transferred in nature through transduction are toxins, enzymes for sugar fermentation, and uh, drug resistance. So illustrated, this is just the F-factor transfer. This, so uh, this is conjugation. So uh, you have a donor in the recipient. So the donor has the little recipe that's an advantage. The recipient does not. not. They have to make a bridge that connect, right? The recipe is going to be copied because, you know, this dude, really likes that recipe. It's a good advantage, so it's going to keep it, makes a copy of it, uh, of that plasmid, of that recipe, and sends it across to the recipient, and now they both have it, and then this bridge is going to be broken up. Uh, there is also a high-frequency transfer. So um, this involves the transmission of a chromosomal gene from a donor cell to a recipient. Uh, the plasmid will jump into the chromosome, and then the chromosome is duplicated. The plasmid is duplicated, and part, but it's, it transfers the plasmid and part of the chromosome into the uh, donor, from the donor to the recipient. And it, but it does also involve that pilus, that bridge, that direct connection. Okay, uh, but then there's part of the chromosome that goes of the of the donor that goes in there with it. Uh, transformation, so. The donor cell dies, its uh, chromosome is broken up into pieces and stuff because it died, and one of those pieces could be taken up by a live cell and then incorporated into its chromosome. And then this one is transduction. So here is the bacteriophage. So they, the bacteriophage, they do look like a, you know, a kind of an alien ship of uh, some sort. So uh, it inserts the phage, um, DNA into the bacterial cell. The phage DNA does what phage does, phage DNA does, what do viruses do? Make more viruses. So what is it going to do? Make more bacterial phages. Um, and as uh, they reassemble, one of them is going to pick up part of uh, a segment of the host DNA. So a plasmid or something like this. It's going to take a, a segment of the host DNA and so one of these bacteriophages basically is kind of defective because it's a, instead of having their viral genome, it has a chunk of the genome of that bacteria cell. Then uh, what happens is the bacteria gets so full of these bacteriophages that it bursts. It releases all the bacteriophages, and then the bacteriophage will go and infect other cells. And so the one that picked up the DNA from the, the previous bacteria is going to go insert it into a new bacteria, which of course will take it up and add it to its chromosome. But if it doesn't code for virus. This was not viral DNA. This one was defective, right? It was just bacterial DNA it picked up. So it's that the little phage is going to, phage virus is going to sit there, and it's, this code is not going to make more bacterial phages. So all the other ones there, it will go make more bacterial phages, and the process will continue. So this is again uh, one way for example that uh, so it, if you remember earlier we talked about E. coli 0157H7 and it's a, a Shiga toxin producing E. coli so the toxin came from Shigella and we think that this is potentially one way that uh, this got transferred so anyway but that's the idea is you get the, 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 the toxin 
that can be produced by a certain species can cross over to another species uh, using that, as long as the bacteriophage can uh, infect both species. Now, if that bacteriophage cannot infect both of those species, then um, it would have, uh, it can be through conjugation can happen, happen interspecies also. So anyway, all that is really interesting. Transposons are jumping genes. Um, and so transposons in humans can also cause like cancers and different things like that. But they're basically transposable elements that are capable, that are capable from shifting from one part of the genome to another. And so in humans, for example, a transposon would be if, if chunk, uh, chunk of uh, chromosome one jumped and got onto chromosome, I don't know, 19 or something like that. And then those can make some of the genes that cause cancers. Um, a uh, jumping gene can be transferred from uh, a chromosome to a plasmid or a plasmid to a chromosome from one cell to another in bacteria and even in some, in, and in some eukaryotes. Some replicate themselves before jumping to the next location and some simply move. They are involved in changes in traits such as their colony morphology, their pigmentation, and anagenic characteristics. Uh, they're involved in replacement of damaged DNA, and involved in intramicrobial transfer of drug resistance in bacteria, so jumping genes. So uh, here in, so you, your gene code is in purple, the transposon is in blue, and so it's that dislocation, and this one it just shows it jumping uh, over to dislocation, but it didn't copy itself. Here it's made uh, several copies of itself, so now it's, it's jumped and it's into four different locations. And then here it jumped from the chromosome into a plasmid. So now it's part of the plasmid. It can jump into from that. It can, the, when the plasmid is copied and donated, then it can go into a different bacterial cell. Okay, so again, uh, match these with their definitions. And now let's talk about mutations. So uh, the wild top is always a microorganism that will exhibit the natural non-mutated characteristic. And then the mutant strain shows a variance in one or more of the following. It's either a variance in morphology, nutritional characteristics, gene control mechanisms, resistance to chemicals, temperature preference, and any type of enzymatic function change. Okay, updated, whatever. So um, causes of mutations, you have spontaneous mutations. So it's a random change in the DNA that arises from errors in replication. An induced mutation is uh, the result from exposure of known mutagens, which are primarily physical or chemical agents that disrupt DNA. Those are, for example, radiation, such as UV light and x-rays, and chemicals such as, for example, nitrous acid. There are several categories of mutations. So a point mutation is the addition, deletion, or substitution of a base. So think about if you had a gene and it was like 200 bases long in code. In addition, you add one of the nucleotides in there. So now you have 201 nucleotides in that gene, okay? Uh, a deletion, you have 200, you lose one, so now you have 199, okay? And then a substitution, you have 200, you still have 200, but somewhere in there, maybe an A got swapped for a T, or an A got swapped for a G, or something like that. So something got swapped. A missense mutation is any change in the code that leads to the placement of a different amino acid. So if it's a different amino acid, that could result in a fault, faulty non-functional non, non protein. Because remember, the proteins, um, their function is determined by their shape, and their shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids. So if you change what amino acid is in there, it's going to change the way it folds or interacts and, and stuff like that. So it, it'll change its shape. Uh, it can produce a, a protein that simply functions differently. And it is possible also to cause no significant alteration. It, so it could be that the, that that amino acid switch doesn't actually really make a big difference at all in the 3D shape of the protein. And it can continue functioning the way it's supposed to. A nonsense mutation uh, changes a normal mutation into a stop codon. Um, and so that would be a problem, right? Because it would stop uh, that recipe or that code right there. 
A silent mutation, it alters a base, so a nucleotide base, but it does not change the amino acids, so therefore it has no effect. So we saw in that table earlier how several different codons could code for the same amino acid, so if it alters one of the bases that still makes it read as the same amino acid, then you just there's no, no effect that's visible. A back mutation is when a gene that has undergone a mutation reverts back to its original base composition. And a frame shift mutation, which are the, the ones that really mess stuff up. So again, same thing. So if you add a base or delete a base, then everything past that addition or insertion, everything down, downstream of that is uh, going to be altered. Because uh, if you remove one, then everything shifts one way by one. If you add one, everything shifts the other way by one, so that every everything is read one off, which me makes it a completely different code, and it off, often results in a non-functional protein. So again, match up your definitions here uh, with the words, words definitions there. Uh, and so here's a little bit on how DNA can be repaired. So um, you have first um, the uh, enzyme complex here um, proofreads and it sees that it's, it's messed up. And so it uses uh, molecular scissors that are endonucleases to cut the, the bad section out. Okay. And then it uses DNA polymerase 1 and ligase to fix it, to add the correct bases and tie them all in together and then you get the repaired DNA and that can happen in our cells and in bacterial cells and all of that okay so uh, let's talk a little bit about enzymes for splicing and dicing nucleic acids so this is where all of the, the advances in genetics have come from is the fact that we figured out how to do this so now all of a sudden we can we can cut genes section genes out and put them into uh, from one organism into a different organisms and stuff like that we can modify genomes uh, we can do all kinds of stuff okay so what made that possible is the discovery of restriction endonucleases so these are the molecular scissors that can cut so there are enzymes capable of recognizing foreign dna and breaking the phosphodiester bonds between the nucleotides on both strands of DNA. So it can break that backbone, basically, that holds the, on both strands of DNA, that holds that DNA, uh, that code together, right? It's, uh, its function in bacteria is to protect bacteria against incompatible DNA of the bacteriophages. So it protects it against bacteriophages by helping it destroy the DNA of the bacteriophage, removing the DNA of the bacteriophage and all of that. And of course, now it allows biotechnologists to cleave DNA at desired sites. Um, it's a necessary uh, component of recombinant DNA technology. And uh, the site that it cuts at is called a palindrome. It clips, uh, and palindromes are sections that can be re read the same way forward and backwards. Um, and so if, if you know where the palindromes are and you know which which in, in, uh, restriction endonuclease enzyme can cut at that specific palindrome, you add it, and no matter what type of DNA it is, once it sees that palindrome, it cuts right there, okay? Okay, so uh, ligases are necessary to still the, the cut ends back together. So uh, it's, it's the part of the cut and paste. So the endonucleases are the scissor, the ligases are the glue. So that when you take it from one and you want to put it into another, you have to be able to glue it into the code. Um, so first you use your nucleus to cut at this, you know, uh, the proper location, and then you can use the ligase to glue it, the new code in. So it is used in the final splicing of genes into plasmids and chromosomes. Um, so reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that has a role in the replication of the AIDS virus because it is used to convert RNA into DNA to make complementary DNA, and so um, that's why uh, HIV is a retrovirus because it, it, you know, it goes from RNA to DNA instead of DNA to RNA. And the complementary DNA is uh, DNA that's made from either messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. 
and it is used to synthesize eukaryotic genes from messenger RNA, and uh, it is free from uh, introns. So um, all of these are important uh, tools that we use in genetic engineering and stuff like that. So again, match up your definitions so you can keep it all straight. So um, then how do we analyze DNA? This is another big question. So uh, the primary um, mode, and we've, we've done a lot to refine this, but and we're going to talk a bit about it also in the next lesson. But uh, let's talk about gel electrophoresis. So uh, gel electrophoresis produces a readable pattern of DNA fragments. The samples are placed in a compartment, in, a, in compartments, so in holes, in a soft auger gel and they're subjected to an electrical current. The electrical current will move the molecules because phosphate groups have a negative charge, which will cause the DNA to move towards the positive pole of the gel. So negative moves towards positive. The larger fragments will migrate more slowly. The smaller fragments will migrate more quickly. And the positions of the fragments it, you know, it'll go up, you know, in the gel, they'll, they'll kind of, once you, you remove the electricity, they stop and, and they stop at different locations. Um, and you can determine the position of the fragments by staining the gel and it creates a genetic fingerprint. Okay. So uh, this is what it looks like. So first we use the restriction endonucleases to cut the DNA into little strands, right? Into pieces. Okay. Uh, and then, um, that we actually can amplify the DNA and all of that, but uh, it's loaded in here in these wells, right? So uh, the, this is loaded into gel, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna follow the yellow one here. So this is right here. It's loaded into gel in position three, and you have all these different size fragments, and they will move towards the positive end. So we have negative to positive. It's gonna move towards the positive end as electricity is run through this gel, and they will separate out. The biggest ones being here, having moved the slowest, the smaller ones, uh, ones being over here, and it will create a set type of pattern, right? And so um, you have you have markers here. This is just to make sure that it worked. Um, and what you can do, for example, in forensics, is you could run, let's say, in in yellow was uh, one of your suspects, and then um, there's another suspect and another suspect, and then you can run your crime scene sample, and then you can match up the patterns and see, you know, which ones it matches. So that's the original way of doing it. And you can, again, stain it, and there's a way to x-ray it and all of that to where it produces these images of patterns. And uh, they, they are unique for, in, the pattern is unique for each individual. Okay, so uh, let's talk also about hybridization. So hybridization is also a big, big, big tool that uh, we've capitalized on for a lot of the, the genetic testing. So hybridization makes it possible to identify a microbe by analyzing segments of its genetic material. A probe is manufactured, right, by, uh, you know, the companies. It's a small segment of DNA or RNA that is known to be complementary to the specific sequence that you're looking for from a microbe. So we know it has this microbe that has this, this sequence and it's unique to that microbe, right? And so we make a, the sequence that complements it so it binds and um, so that it will base pair the probe to the nucleic acid to, to half that genetic code of the microbe to the half of that DNA strand of the microbe and then we can tag the probes when we make them with a fluorescent label. And if the probe bound onto the DNA code uh, and we bombard it with the, the, the right UV light stuff, and then it will glow, it'll fluoresce, okay? And, and so that will indicate that indeed that is positive for the identification of that specific microbe that that probe was made for. So here's another video that I will kind of comment on. So it's not very long, but it just shows, okay, so here's your normal DNA strand, right? When you heat up strands, they will separate, okay? So then you have two single strand pieces of DNA. And when you cool them, they reassemble. Okay, so we know that. So we have two DNA sources, A and B, 
right? And uh, if these guys are complementary, what could happen is when you heat them up, the complementary strands can bind to each other, right? They can swap, and it binds perfectly when you cool it back down. Okay, so then what we do is we take advantage of that, and we manufacture uh, a probe so it, it can be, um, you know, put on a, a plate well or something like that, okay? So um, that's the complementary probe to the sequence that we're looking for, I believe. That's the way. So bound on extracellular gel. And then the homologous DNA, so the DNA that can match it, can then bind to it, and it will stay there. It will stay stuck. If it's non-homologous DNA, if it doesn't match, it can't stick to it. It can't bind, and so it will be washed off in one of the steps, okay? And so then if it's present, uh, you know, depending on which one's tagged on the gel and which one's what, you, you, um, you know, can tag it with fluorescent dye and stuff like that. So that's the idea of hybridization. Okay. Uh, the third really big thing is polymerase chain reaction. So polymerase chain reaction allows you to amplify DNA. So to take one little bit of DNA and make a lot of DNA of, that's identical to it. So it rapidly increases the amount of DNA in a sample without the need of making cultures or carrying out some complex purification techniques. It is sensitive, sensitive enough to detect cancer from a single cell or diagnose an infection from a single gene copy. Okay? It is rapid enough to replicate the target DNA from a few copies to billions of copies in just a few hours. Okay, so the idea is it uses some of the principle already that we just, just looked at in hybridization is we know if you heat it to 94 Celsius, the strands separate. Okay? And so what they're going to do is uh, part of the, the process of, of uh, PCR is you have primers that are part of the, uh, the reagents, and then you have all the, all the nucleotides that you need. <clears throat> and so when the strand separates, the uh, primers can bind onto it as it cools. As it cools, the primers bind onto it. And then when the primers bind, they'll add nucleotides and copy it. And then you have two copies of that DNA. And then you take each of these copies, you heat it up again. So now uh, they separate, the primers can bind, you cool it down, it copies and adds the, each of them copies and adds the bases, and now you've got one, two, three, four strands. So we went from one to two, two to four, and you can see how we can grow here logarithmic. One to two, two to four, four to eight, et cetera, et cetera. And so in like 30 cycles, you can have, very easily have a million copies. And a cycle only takes a few minutes. So again, this is a short video that illustrates that. So you have your DNA strand, parent DNA strand there. So uh, <clears throat> this is the gene of interest that you want to amplify. It's double-stranded DNA. And uh, we're going to first subject it to some heat here. They'll talk about it here in a second. Well, they're not talking. I'm talking. But it'll come up here in a second. And so, uh, yeah, so you have your deoxyribonucleotides, uh, so your ACTs and Gs, you have TAC polymerase, which the enzyme needed, and then you have your primers, your, your DNA primers, okay? And so you have, those are all the components that are part of the reagents, and then when you heat up, these strands separate, okay? And then the, uh, as it starts cooling, the DNA primers can bind on the beginning sequence, TAC polymerase binds onto the primer, and then it adds the nucleotides until it gets to the stop to the end of the gene, okay? And so it's done that, and it's done a copy, and now you heat it up again, separates, cool it, it binds with TAC polymerase, and then you just, it was going to keep amplifying these, the, the one section that you're looking for. And before you know it, you're going to have a whole bunch, so you can see how it amplifies really quickly, and uh, really quickly again in just a few uh, a few hours, you can get millions and millions of copies. Okay, so recombinant DNA technology then is 
the primary intent of recombinant DNA technology is to deliberately remove genetic material from one organism and combine it with that of a different organism. So uh, if you think about it in everyday life, all of the GMO crops are a product of recombinant DNA technology. Um, and where they've taken genes from insects and other things and inserted it into corn, into wheat, into other things to have specific effects. Um, bacteria can be genetically engineered this, in this way to mass produce hormones, enzymes, vaccines, etc. So, uh, for example, one of the, the hormones that's produced that way is insulin. So, uh, it is definitely it has a lot of good ben beneficial applications. Um, there are some always some dark sides to it, like everything else. And so, uh, again, with genetic, uh, recombinant genetic DNA technology, you can do genetic clones or cloning. So it involves a removal of a selected gene from an animal, plant, or microorganisms, and propagating it in a host or it's propagating in a host of microorganism in a host microorganism, sorry. The donor gene must be excised by the restriction endonucleases and isolated, so it has to be removed from the donor and isolated, and then it has to be inserted into a vector. So usually we, the vector is what's going to allow that gene to be delivered, so it's gonna be a plasmid or a virus, because virus infects cells. So um, when you're talking about gene therapy in humans, a lot of times it's using viruses that can deliver the gene to that specific cell. The vector, so let's say the virus or the plasmid, will take that gene and insert it into the cloning host, into the other organism you want it to go into. And then the cloning host uh, is usually a bacterium or a yeast, and it can translate the uh, gene into the desired protein. So for example, you can use yeast, you, uh, you, through this uh, vector transfer, you, you transfer the code for insulin in there, and then uh, the yeast that duplicate themselves, they all can produce insulin. And so you just give them a nice petri dish with all the food and all the stuff that they want to replicate and they'll, they'll grow and replicate themselves, but they'll constantly produce insulin and you just harvest the insulin. So that's pretty cool in a lot of ways. Okay. So, uh, we'll go, the last lesson will go deeper into um, all the different ways to diagnose infections and stuff like that. And we'll bring up again, some of these newer technologies. Uh, so all of these that we looked at are um, kind of specific for um, the, the DNA, but we're all gonna talk about a few more. So if you have any questions, uh, listen there and thank you again for your attention.